When he was around 30 years old, Ludwig von Beethoven started to notice in his conversations that he was having trouble hearing people with deep voices. There were long intervals that he could hear sounds, but couldn't understand a word of what was being said. He was actually surprised more people didn't notice him straining when they were talking to him. And it got worse. At the opera, he would try his hardest and he just couldn't hear the high notes of the music. He realized he was going deaf. Now, for an aspiring composer like Beethoven, whose life was his art, was this not tantamount to a death sentence? He later more or less admitted that's how he felt, and that he seriously contemplated suicide. But in the pit of his despair, he turned to one of his favorite authors from antiquity. As he wrote to his friend Franz Wegler in 1801, How often have I cursed my existence, but Plutarch led me to resignation. I will strive so far as possible to defy fate, even though there will be moments in my life where I will be the most unhappy of all God's creatures. And so, Beethoven decided to retreat to the countryside to regroup. Somehow, he figured out how to cope. And, as you probably know, he eventually went totally deaf, and also went on to become one of the greatest composers in history. One of Beethoven's favorite books, one that he returned to again and again in his life, was Plutarch's collection of biographies, The Parallel Lives. And if you listen to this podcast, you will hear these biographies retold. It's as simple as that. Plutarch was an ancient philosopher. He lived nearly 2,000 years ago and wrote about the lives of famous Greeks and Romans. And like Beethoven, many other famous and ambitious people have admired the parallel lives, like Harry Truman, Frederick Douglass, Ben Franklin, Napoleon, Machiavelli. Now, one brief note in Beethoven's journal comes from a biography of a somewhat lesser known figure with which I have chosen to begin. A tragic figure, but perhaps a relatable one. In many ways, he inspired me to begin this podcast project. He's a Roman that Plutarch says had all the skill and virtue of so many great figures of the past, but worse luck than any of them. His name is Sertorius. So let us tell his story in the hopes that we too can learn to defy fate, like Beethoven, and perhaps like Sertorius as well. I'm Alex Petkus, and you are listening to The Cost of Glory by Ancient Life Coach. This is The Life of Sertorius, part one of three. Sertorius walked in slow, measured paces, trying to keep his gaze pointed forward. Kids ran up to see them, shouting. Flowers were getting thrown in their faces. Drums, reed instruments. He never thought the first triumph he would see would be one he was marching in. It was strange to be wearing togas with these guys, civilian, peacetime, formal wear, not to hear the swords clinking at their sides. He was a ways from the front, but once they got through the triumphal gate, where the city starts to get a little hilly, he caught glimpses of the leading parts of the procession. There were the chieftains, striking blonde hair to their shoulders, bound in chains. Their best-looking warriors, led in chains, close behind. Behind them, carts carrying their elegant barbarian swords and helmets. And then, following proudly after them, there were the grand old men. You couldn't miss them. Three hundred or so of them. Gleaming white togas, fringed with striking purple borders. The most powerful institution in the world. The entire Senate. They looked so vulnerable there, without their entourages. So soft. Some of those guys haven't seen battle in a long time. Some of them never really saw it up close. And then, when the line of sight was right, he could see the chariot, the center of it all. That's where the champions rode, the generals. It was usually just one, but this time it was both of the consuls riding along, robed in purple, vanquishers of these dreaded Kimbri, an aristocrat and a commoner, Lutatius Catullus and Gaius Marius. It took both of them to bring down these barbarians, now walking in chains before them. It took everything Rome had, 
the consuls rode there, crowned with laurels, their faces painted red, and the whole city of Rome was united around them in celebrating this triumph. But Sertorius saw all of this unity as a bit of a sham, wishful thinking at best. That war was tough, but knowing what the Senate and Gaius Marius thought of each other, he was starting to suspect that fighting the Cimbri had been the easy part. In this podcast, we retell the stories of the Greek and Roman heroes in order to sharpen ourselves to face the present. Our subject, Sertorius, was a traitor in the eyes of many and a hero to others. He went on to be perhaps the greatest Roman rebel, and he certainly was the greatest Roman guerrilla warrior. He reminds me a little bit of the great distance runner, Steve Prefontaine. Have you heard of him? Well, if not, that kind of proves my point. He was a superb athlete. But due to different tragedies that cut their stories short, both of these men are nowadays less well-known than other major contemporaries. But there's a small circle of devotees that recognizes that these guys were absolute masters of their craft. Now, Plutarch wrote parallel biographies. He liked to compare individual Greeks and Romans, and we're going to do that too. Like his parallel Greek counterpart, Eumenes, Sertorius's craft was the art of war. And both of these ancient characters, I think, supremely embody what Stephen Pressfield has called the warrior ethos. More on Eumenes later. His biography is up next. Let's get to Sertorius. And Plutarch introduces his biography by observing... It's odd, you know. The most warlike of generals and those who achieved the most by a mixture of cunning and skill have been one-eyed men, Philip of Macedon, Antigonus, Hannibal, and the subject of this life, Sertorius. In relation to these, we may say that he was more continent with women than Philip, more faithful to his friends than Antigonus, more merciful toward his enemies than Hannibal, and inferior to none of them in understanding, though in fortune to them all. Even though at every juncture he had tougher luck than his enemies, he nonetheless made himself the equal of Metellus in experience, equal of Pompey in daring, equal of Sulla in fortune, and equal of Rome in power. And he did this as an exile and a stranger in command of barbarians. Now, in 101 BC, when he walked in that triumphal parade, a young soldier, about 24, Sertorius had a lot of reasons to be optimistic. The Romans had just won a very difficult war. They had vanquished the Cimbri, their most frightening enemy in a hundred years. It was worth a lavish celebration. And Sertorius was now close to some of the leading men in this city, a city that ruled an empire that stretched from Spain to Turkey controlled most of the Mediterranean Sea. Not all of it yet, but hey, who knows? Sertorius had real prospects in life. Just surviving this long was a lot more than he had hoped for at times. Now the Cimbri, those barbarians that eventually got paraded in that victory triumph, they were a collection of Northern European tribes, probably of Germanic ethnicity, maybe Gallic. The Romans weren't really sure. It was kind of hard to tell sometimes since a big army like the Cimbri, they often pick up a lot of opportunists from all over the place. And these Cimbri were joined by a tribe called the Teutones, which is where we get the word Teutonic, meaning German. And that maybe suggests that they were at least some Germans in that bunch. But whatever their ethnicity, one thing was clear. These northern invaders were physically a lot larger than the Romans. Now, the Cimbri had come on the Romans' radar when they started raiding and invading Transalpine Gaul, which was the Romans' foothold in the area that's now the south of France. And some 500 miles away, safe in the little town of Nursia, in the central heartland of Roman Italy, Sertorius and his friends were growing up, playing Romans versus Cimbri with wooden swords and sticks and whatnot. Kings versus consuls, maybe. It was the defining conflict of the youth of that generation. These kids would dream of one day going to the frontier, facing them in battle. And that day came for Sertorius when he was about 20 years old. By that time, 105 BC, the Cimbri had been campaigning in the area for almost a decade, 
and really giving the Romans hell. At that point, they had already routed several Roman armies. They'd already killed two Roman consuls on the battlefield. As many as 300,000 fighting men had invaded Gaul, carting their families around with them in covered wagons because, hey, they had no plans for leaving. And they thought maybe they'd fight better if they had no plan B, if they staked it all on this invasion. And they were talking big now. They beat up those Romans pretty bad, and now they were thinking, well, if we can handle them in Gaul, we can handle them in Italy. Just imagine, boys, we could be living the high life in those rich fields of the Po Valley in northern Italy. So this war was starting to get scarier every year the Romans didn't win. So Sertorius and the new recruits in 105 BC, they finish their training, they march up through northern Italy, across the Alps, into southern France. Again, Transalpine Gaul, they called it, Gallia Transalpina. That's where the frontier was. Now, on the Roman side, well, in the past, the Romans had a, a tradition of sort of middle-class citizen farmers who were supposed to pay for and supply their own gear. That was the ideal back in the day. But this was just starting to change, officially. The great general, Marius, a guy we already met, he'd removed that property requirement a couple of years earlier because... The Romans were getting spread pretty thin lately. They had peacekeeping forces in all these new places that they had conquered over the last century. Their empire was expanding. Security needs were expanding. But with their existing recruitment system, the base of soldiers was not expanding, at least not fast enough. It was just too difficult to raise an army if you put that requirement, which was basically a wealth qualification, on new recruits. So now... There was a huge wave of new enlistments. Some were lower class Roman citizens who couldn't enlist before. Some were non-citizens, poorer people from all over Italy. They probably hoped that this war would change their fortunes. I mean, isn't that why many soldiers join the army? We like to think that it's patriotism, and of course it often is, especially if there's an existential threat like, you know, a situation like World War II or something, or the invasion of the Cimbri. But a lot of these guys that especially those Italians who weren't even Roman citizens, they were probably hoping for some loot, a veteran's pension, or the big prize, a little plot of land of their own. But maybe, for a lot of them, the most important thing is they're hoping to get some respect, finally, some honor, maybe level up in status. So it was these men and their sons that Sertorius lines up alongside in formation, 20 years old, on a hot August day in 105 BC, as they await the berserker charge of the Kimri warriors at a place called Arausio. Arausio was the northernmost fort of the Romans in Gaul then, on the banks of the Rhone River. Today it's called Orange. And as Sertorius saw the Kimri forming up on the other side of the field, doing their war dances, he must have thought, this is bad. Not because the Kimri were formidable enemies, they were, and that was scary, but he realized that this campaign season, and maybe, who knows, all the ones before it and after it, were going to be a lot harder to win because of the disastrous incompetence and corruption of the Roman ruling classes. And he was now getting to experience this firsthand at Arausio. Because there were two separate Roman armies on the field, commanded by two independent generals. And this was precisely the problem. One of the generals was a nobleman, middle-aged, handsome in the past, gentle features, looked like he felt uncomfortable and out of place in a military breastplate. His name was Caipio. He had been consul the year before. Now, the consulship, shared by two men, was the supreme Roman office. It was a one-year term. But if there were military duties to be done, as there pretty much always were in these days, then you could stay on and command an army as a pro-consul, so an ex-consul but still in charge of an army. And that was what Caipio was doing. He had been dispatched by the Senate to Gaul in 106 while he was consul, and then the next year, stayed on in command of his army as a proconsul. And the other general was one of the two current consuls of the year, 
It was a man named Malleus. Now, the Senate had sent Malleus along to help out Caipio in the fight with the Kimri in Gaul. And, well, you wonder if they asked Caipio his opinion, if he wanted some help. Or maybe there was some misunderstanding when they asked him, because now there was an argument over who was in charge. And as the duly elected consul, Malleus, the new guy, was technically supposed to be Caipio's superior on the battlefield. But as Caipio saw it, Malleus was lower social status. He was what they called a new man, a novus homo, the first person in his family to reach high office, to reach the status of a senator. And as Caipio saw it, I guess, this guy was just some schmo from some unknown family. But Caipio, Caipio was the son of a consul. He had consuls in his family going back a century and a half. Sure, there were some administrative technicalities, but come on, it was beneath his dignity to defer to this new arrival. So Caipio refused, and he made up some twisted justification, of course, about when and where the enemy was first engaged, whatever. The bottom line is he refused to defer to the new guy. And Sertorius was in Caipio's army as a junior officer. In that role, at age 20, he's probably not going to have a whole lot of major duties, but he's going to follow the general around, attend some meetings and debriefings, and be a lot closer to the decision-making. Junior officers are basically there to learn while they fight, kind of like camp mentees. And wow, Sertorius had learned a lot. And judging from their actions... The Kimbri chieftains had learned a lot too. They were clever, and they could see the disunity in the command structure, and now they were exploiting it. So now, while the Roman generals had been bickering, the armies divided, the Kimbri ready their troops and attack with their full force. The armies clash. The Kimbri crumple Caipio's forces, and drive Sertorius and his comrades against the Rhone River. The Romans have no way to maneuver. They're getting cut to pieces. Then, part of the Cimbri forces move on to attack Malleus' army, which was hanging back by the fort, and they overwhelm it too. And the details of battle are hazy here, probably because so few men survived. But the Cimbri won a total victory at Arausio. The reports say that the Romans lost some 80,000 fighting men that day. Some reports told that only 10 men survived. It was the greatest Roman defeat in more than 100 years. And after the Roman forces collapse and a general panic ensues, Sertorius' horse has been killed, he's been wounded, and he has to make a quick decision. Should he wait around to be enslaved, or worse, when the Cimbri capture him? Should he charge headlong into a tornado of Cimbrian blades to a glorious but absolutely certain death. Or he looks at the Rhone River. It's more than 350 meters, over seven times the distance across an Olympic pool. And that's a pretty swift current. So who knows how long he'll actually have to be swimming once the current starts carrying him. And there's not much time to weigh the options. Imagine what Sertorius must have been thinking. He's standing there on the riverbank, screams and stabbing and chaos all around. He's bleeding, exhausted. He's wondering if he can make it across that river. That's the biggest river he's ever seen. It's a lot bigger than the Tiber back home. It's going to take every bit of willpower and concentration to have a shot at surviving. And Sertorius resolves he's going to be one of the ones who lives. So he swam those 350 meters or more, and he did it with his full armor and shield on him. Now what kind of man does this, trusts himself to that water with all his heavy gear on? You know, there's a story of a Greek king who got a coat of super light chainmail from one of the world master blacksmiths, and it's 50 pounds, and everyone's amazed at how light that is for a breastplate. So at least 50 pounds of armor on Sertorius, probably a lot more. And then the shield, 
who knows if it's wood or leather, it's maybe 20 or 30 pounds at least, maybe more. So what kind of man makes that call and then has the physical strength and willpower to actually pull it off at age 20? Well, he was a country boy. Sertorius was born in Nursia. Nursia is in the country of the Sabines. It's two or three days journey from Rome, north, near the highest mountains in that part of Italy. It was famous for its harsh winters and also for its turnips. This is like upstate New York, maybe. People are a little more conservative, self-reliant, woodsy. That's the stereotype, at least. Back in the mythic founding days of Rome, when Rome was just a tiny, weak city-state, the Romans had stolen away some women from the Sabine country and made them their wives. Famous story, or legend, really. I'll leave it for the biography of Romulus. But for this and other reasons, the Romans kind of felt like the Sabines were blood kin. And the people of Nursia, for centuries, had enjoyed that coveted right of Roman citizenship. But you know, they were sort of bumpkins still in the eyes of the cultured Roman gentry. And how many times did the aristocrats joke about those turnip farmers in Nursia when they were trying to put this upstart Sertorius in his place? How would that have fueled his determination to prove them what he was capable of. And I think it was when he was a boy growing up deep in the Sabine country that that's where Sertorius got his famous taste for the wilderness. I picture him scouting out paths, hunting in those woods, sleeping under the stars. You don't often think of Romans as rugged woodsmen, but Sertorius he was the kind of guy who was capable of vanishing without a trace and then materializing out of a thicket when you least expected him. You could be dead before you ever knew anyone was there. Now, Sertorius wasn't from some august noble lineage. They weren't blue bloods, but they were a respectable family in the equestrian class. And he was raised by a single mom, actually. He lost his father at a young age, maybe before he was born, we don't know. And his mother did her best. She arranged to have him educated like a future leader, like a warrior. So he learned to throw a javelin, ride a horse, that kind of thing. Probably some financial bookkeeping skills. He also learned to read and write and speak, Latin, of course. But he learned some Greek too, everyone did. And I kind of imagine his mom, her name was Rhea, I kind of imagine her like a Spartan mother. You know, the sort of woman that would hand her son a shield as he went off to battle and tell him, come back with it or on it. Because in those days, throwing away your shield in battle was taken as a sign that you had fled like a coward. So you can kind of see now why Sertorius made a point of towing that thing across the Rhone River. Your shield kind of represents your will to keep fighting. Can you imagine what it must have been like for a country boy like that to come and see Rome? What stood out to him? With the eyes we have today, we may think of the Forum, the huge glorious temples, the great temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill at the center of everything. Maybe being where he was from, he was drawn to the temple of Diana, the hunter goddess on the Aventine Hill in the rougher district of town on the south side, kind of, you know, across the tracks. But, you know, the names filling the place might have been equally dazzling. These great families he had grown up hearing about. These households. I mean, these aristocrats controlled huge fortunes. Thousands of acres, thousands of slaves, statues, mansions. People who had their names on bridges and streets and laws. And the size of the place, too must have been just a lot to take in. Largest city in the world at that point. Maybe three quarters of a million people living there on the low end of estimates. Must have blown his mind. So he was a country boy, and he was tough. But he was still kind of a nobody, especially in the eyes of a Caipio. And if you're a kid from Nursia, trying to get ahead in this world, trying to make something of yourself in the Roman army, you're going to want to look for ways to stand out in front of the people who can make or break your career. You're going to want to impress your superiors. How are you going to do that? 
Well, fight hard, of course, do some brave deed. But what if there aren't any great battles going on? Well, you might just have to create an opportunity. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the show. We'll get right back to it, but I want to take a moment to acknowledge one of our sponsors today. Some of the most transformative experiences I've had have been when I've had the opportunity to travel to a strange place with someone who really understood its culture and history in a deep way. So I'm really excited to have as a sponsor for this episode a company that does just this sort of thing for classical sites, the kind of places we mention often in the Cost of Glory podcast, places like Athens, Rome, Sicily, southern France, northern Greece. The Paideia Institute is a nonprofit educational company run and staffed by experts in the ancient Greco-Roman world, and they put on world-class tours for groups and individuals. I've been lucky enough to be a guest lecturer on more than one. They also offer online courses in the classical languages, that is Greek and Latin, which I think every English speaker should learn if they have an opportunity. Paideia is the Greek word for education, and the Paideia Institute also runs a number of programs to promote education. They do scholarships, after-school programs, lots of good stuff. Check out their website at paideiainstitute.org. That's P-A-I-D-E-I-A institute.org. So the war didn't stop with the defeat at Arausio. The Romans mustered another army. And at one point, later in the war, the Romans are in hostile territory, and they're having trouble figuring out what the Cimbri are up to. It's not easy to get intelligence. The Romans are in the territory of Celtic or Gallic peoples, somewhere there in Gaul in southern France. Celt and Gaul, by the way, two words for more or less the same group of peoples in antiquity. Celt is from a Greek word. Gaul is from a Latin word. And the Cimbri on the other hand, are probably Germans, not Celts themselves, but they were allied to some of the Celts in the area. And the Romans had some Celtic allies too. But you know, the Celts were a hodgepodge of different tribal federations, and a lot of this area is still really hostile territory to the Romans. And the Cimbri are kind of lurking way back behind the frontier, deep in Celtic territory, roving here and there, which made the Romans really nervous. Where are they gonna materialize and strike next? So Sertorius comes up with an idea. He sees a gap. He decides to learn the local tribe's Celtic language. Now, how's he going to do that? They didn't have textbooks back then, not for that kind of language. For Greek or Latin, maybe, not for Celtic. So he has to spend a lot of time with some of these people, ask a lot of questions. You can imagine it got a little awkward at times, but somehow he picks up enough Celtic, the language, and probably some customs as well, you know? which finger not to point with, and that kind of thing. And he picks up enough to be dangerous. And then he puts on a disguise, maybe bleaches his hair blonde, and he infiltrates deep into hostile territory. He roots around. And this would make a great sequence in a movie, don't you think? You can imagine all the near misses. Now, where did you say you were from? And that kind of thing. And so he snoops here and there, gathers some info, and manages to make it back to base without getting caught. And he brings some key piece of intelligence to his commander. Now, the kind of guy that volunteers for that kind of mission at age 22 or so, hasn't a guy like that decided already that he's going to go all out? And it wasn't just any commander that he impressed. Sertorius went straight to the top, to the supreme commander of the Cimbrian war effort. Sir, I've got news that only you should hear. Well, better be good, son. And that supreme commander was Gaius Marius. Now, to understand who Marius was, you have to understand that that battle that Sertorius survived, the Battle of Arausio, this was a huge shock to the state. And it's this event that made a historian from around that time, Sallust, remark that the Romans both then and up to our days have held that while all else is within their capabilities, their struggles with the Gauls are for salvation, not for glory. Sallust 
They're one of the ones that thought the Cimbri were Gauls rather than Germans. And the Gauls were more familiar to the Romans at that point because they had a long, painful history with the Gauls that went way back. And they actually thought that they had sorted out the Gaul problem on the northern borders centuries ago. But now they realized that they hadn't. And Marius was the kind of hatchet man that you call in very reluctantly if you're the Roman Senate, only when everyone else failed. Marius was an extremely competent general, a former consul, and he had risen to power earlier on a wave of popular support, especially because of his success in a war in North Africa. But he was a pretty low-born guy. He was from a little town called Arpinum. That's actually where Cicero was from. And Marius started off as really a nobody in the eyes of the Caipios and Metelluses of the world. And he was running his political military campaigns on a sort of drain the swamp ticket. You know, these nobles are corrupt and flabby and Gaius Marius is going to bring back the good old days of Rome winning again. And we'll save the details for the biography of Marius coming soon. But Marius was re-elected consul for the second time in 104 after Arausio promising to clean up the Cimbrian mess. And so that's how Sertorius met him. And that elite spy ops mission that Sertorius did was how he got into Marius's circle. Sertorius became a kind of mentee, and Marius did indeed win the war. But even before that war, people really had a lot of hope in Marius. Marius meant possibility, opportunity. He'd figured out clever ways to legally disrupt the system, to open up gaps in the sort of walls around access to power at Rome. Walls that had been put up there by tradition, or maybe by the nobles themselves who ran the power game. And Marius wanted to give talented political outsiders a chance. And this really appealed to a man like Sertorius, also an outsider himself. And Sertorius was good. Probably, by the way, trained by the great Stoic master of military discipline, Rutilius Rufus. He was good, but... For a man like Sertorius to make a name for himself at Rome, he was going to need well-placed friends. And when the war ended, he had one in Gaius Marius, the vanquisher or co-vanquisher with Catullus. And now with the war over, Marius was the single most powerful man in Rome. He had actually been awarded four consulships in a row to ensure that he had all the authority he needed to finish the Cimbrian War. This totally smashed precedent. You were supposed to wait 10 years between consulships. And for anyone to hold it more than once was very rare. Nobody had ever held it five times before, but Marius had. And Marius and his army, they had saved the Republic from the enemy. The greatest thing any Roman can hope to do, the thing that all the Romans wanted to be thought of as doing. But now, it's peacetime. The war is over. The triumph parade is fading into memory. Life is returning to normal. And normal, in those days, meant very tense. For one thing, Marius was hated and despised by the nobility. And even though he was powerful, he got voted consul again in 100 BC after that triumph for the fifth time in a row, sixth overall. So he's still in power, but he has a weakness. His ability to influence things, his hold on power long term, it all depends on him being able to accomplish certain objectives now. And his enemies, powerful enemies, were going to try to block him politically. Now, what things did he need to accomplish? Well, those soldiers Marius had recruited to fight for him in Africa first and then in Gaul, these were poor men, remember, and they were personally loyal to him. They loved him. He was the kind of guy that would pick up a shovel and dig in the trenches with you, charge the walls with the foot soldiers, that kind of guy. But they were counting on him to see to it that they got rewarded for their service like he promised. And his enemies were going to try to stop him and... These people were very well-entrenched noblemen, very influential in the Senate. In particular, 
It was the Mattelli family. And they had a history with Marius. Marius had actually been a hereditary client of the Mattelli. The Romans had this system of patrons and clients, or bosses and their entourage, or hangers-on, if you will. Each side has obligations to the other. You can imagine a sort of mobster family situation if you like. That's not far off. And Marius was a client of the Metelli. They had promoted Marius. They got him jobs. They made him a made man, so to speak. And how had he returned this favor? He had kind of turned on them after climbing them like a ladder. Again, I don't want to spoil the life of Marius for you, but let's just say that this Marius had shown insufficient gratitude, to say the least. And they were going to give their attempt to block Marius some good-sounding justifications. The state can't afford this expense, Marius. You made your promises without the consent of the Roman people. It's on you, and so on. But Marius decides, in order to beat these old bosses who are out to get him, Marius decides to try to play with fire. There was a certain populist politician who had been reaching out to Marius. The way he saw it, they had common interests. We want to do good things for the common man, get these bigwigs to share some of the pie with the rest of us. So this politician started doing Marius favors. Marius started doing him favors. The man's name was Saturninus. And Saturninus was kind of dangerous, at least in the eyes of the Senate. Good-looking, well-groomed, usually with that sincere, concerned look on his face. A man of the people. And he was really electrifying in front of a crowd. And to understand why the Senate thought Saturninus dangerous, you got to understand that this is a time of great upheaval and massive inequality in Roman society. Rome had risen from a small city-state, a regional player with a political and economic system designed for that kind of state into being a world power, especially in the last 150 years. And there had been huge conquests, often in the name of self-defense, which is kind of funny, but the bottom line is the rich were getting richer, making exotic friends in the new territories, deal-making, collecting art, The city was huge, filled with newcomers, foreigners. Lots of people were getting left out, wondering what was happening to their way of life. So there was a lot of discontent. And anyone who could promise to solve some of these problems effectively, they could potentially wield a lot of influence. And people who tried to do this were called populares, from the Latin word for the people, populus. And their opponents the staunch conservatives, were called the optimates from the Latin word for the best men. And you can kind of tell which side got to pick the names here. And Saturninus was a textbook populares man. For example, after that disaster at Arausio, Saturninus was one of the guys who prosecuted Caipio, that general who refused to defer, divided the forces, and was brightly blamed for the defeat. And while we're on it, there's actually a a backstory to that. So a lot of people thought that the defeat at Arausio happened because of the wrath of the gods. Because Caipio was suspected of stealing some cursed gold from the Gauls, the legendary gold of Toulouse or the gold of Tolosa. It was supposed to be some unimaginably massive treasure that had been plundered long ago from holy temples in Greece by some Gallic raiders. So it was, you know, cursed by the gods because that's a sacrilege. So Saturninus couldn't actually nail Caipio on stealing the gold. He did prosecute him, but he didn't nail him. But he did get him convicted for losing his army at Arausio. And Saturninus got Caipio fined and exiled The nobility tried their best to defend one of their own. They put their best lawyer forward, Licinius Crassus. No use. So Saturninus is dangerous for the nobility, for the optimates. He's a shark, and now there's blood in the water. 
And you wonder what our hero Sertorius thought of all this. And there's a possibility that Caipio was actually his patron, or at least he used to be. So here we are again. The war was over. The triumph is done. Saturninus the shark has done Marius some favors, such as he helped him win the election for consulship, one of those six times. They're working together now. And what Marius really needs is to get an official land grant to reward all of his poor veterans, those vets who had fought so honorably in those wars. And the Metelli, his former patrons, they're going to do anything they can to stop this ingrate. Now, the way that Saturninus could help Marius fighting back against the power of the entrenched nobility in the Senate was that he was one of the tribunes of the plebs for the year 100. And this wasn't his first time in the office. He, he knew what he was doing. Now, the tribune of the plebs was a key office that was designed to be a kind of legal and political representative of the poorer classes in Rome against the abuses of the Senate. There were actually 10 of them every year. And these tribunes were considered sacrosanct, which meant that it was not just a crime, but also a religious offense to hit them or lay hands on them within the city limits. That was supposed to give them some protection, some confidence to do what they needed to do. They didn't have to fear these great bosses using their many thugs to push them around, in theory at least. So Saturninus is one of these guys for the year. And one of the most important powers of the Tribune of the Plebs was that they could call assemblies of the masses and they could write laws and get them passed by a simple majority in these assemblies of the masses. It's called a plebiscite. It wasn't the only way to pass a law at Rome, but it was a valid way. So imagine if in your country you could just hold a general vote on any law without having to get it approved by the Senate or the leadership of the country. You're supposed to get the Senate's approval. It's the polite thing to do, the traditional thing to do, but you don't have to legally for it to be valid. And the gap between what's polite and what's actually legal is where so much of the trouble starts. And the tribunes weren't supposed to do this, but sometimes one or two of them sort of went rogue and they tried to use their powers to challenge the senate directly on their own initiative and this was a way that they could build up their own power and influence in the city the first guys to figure out how to do this were the gracchi brothers in the previous generation we'll see in more detail how this works in their biographies but spoiler alert it ends in a lot of blood so saturninus the shark was definitely playing this rogue tribune of the plebs game. Again, textbook populares political style. And Plutarch has a good Greek word for this kind of guy. Not an official office, but a good adjective in Greek. He's a demagogos, a leader of the people, a demagogue. That's where we get the word too. So to make a long story short, Marius and Saturninus can't get their support the troops bill approved by the Senate. Big surprise. So Saturninus calls one of these popular assemblies of the masses, and they have a vote. And what do you know? Marius's law gets passed to distribute lands and funds to his veterans against a clamor of senatorial opposition. And that was already daring. But things are starting to heat up. They're pissing off a lot of powerful people. But now... Saturninus and Marius see an opportunity and they even go on a war path and force the patriarch of the Metellus family, Caecilius Metellus, into exile. It takes some tricky maneuvering, but they do it. Again, best left to the biography of Marius. But this is really playing with fire. And now Marius starts to get a little bit burned because he's starting to realize that he can't control Saturninus. This guy smells blood in the water. And he's going to push his advantage. And here's how. Saturninus has a buddy. Kind of a similar populist rogue tribune. A guy by the name of Glaucia. But you're not going to need to remember that name for very long. Glaucia now wants to be consul in the next election. Even though he hasn't really earned it. 
other men have better claims. I mean, the consulship is the supreme political and military office, commander in chief. Even Marius had tried to disqualify Glaucia from running. These populares guys are starting to push a little too far, even for Marius here. But Glaucia persists, and he runs in the election. And, long story short, Glaucia ends up having his opponent in the race for consul clubbed to death in broad daylight in the forum, like right in front of the Senate House. And this kicks off a riot. And the Senate, boom, they see their opportunity. They were waiting for this chance to strike back at the populares. And what the Senate does is clever. They realize this is their opportunity to kind of checkmate Marius. The Senate declares a state of emergency, and they declare Glaucia and Saturninus public enemies. And what this means, it's called a Senatus Consultum Ultimum. It's a state of emergency order. It's a binding order from the Senate to the consuls. The consuls are now ordered to do everything they can to eradicate the menace that the Senate has identified, namely Glaucia and Saturninus. So Marius is now trapped. He either goes against the Senate's orders in this emergency situation, political suicide, possibly worse, he could get prosecuted, exiled, or he can crack down on his former allies. So Marius reluctantly arrests his out of control friends. He doesn't kill them, though he was being pressured to do that. He doesn't kill them, but he locks them up in the Senate house overnight to await trial. He's trying to buy himself some time. But that night, a mob rips a hole in the roof and pelts the prisoners to death with roof tiles. Shocking. Unholy. Remember, these are sacrosanct guys. And it's hard to know exactly what Sertorius was doing in all this time. This is kind of a dark zone in his biography. We don't have mentions of him around this time in the sources, but I think it's a loud silence. He was probably laying low around this point, trying to stay out of trouble. He was an associate of Marius, but Marius was persona non grata in the Senate, and Sertorius hadn't snatched himself from the jaws of death at Arausio just so he could die in some no-win street fight. Marius, on the other hand, after this event, was ruined. The Senate blamed him for the riot. They hated that he had disgraced Caecilius Metellus with that exile. This Metellus was his patron. He had been Marius's commander for a while in North Africa. He was a revered patriot. This was hubris. And the people blamed Marius for the deaths of Saturninus and Glaucia, their, their populist champions. They blamed him for not standing up to the Senate. So the great man, disgraced, decided to retire from public life. He traveled some, went abroad. He went and brooded in his massive suburban villa, plotting, resenting, biding his time. And the conservatives in the Senate, the Optimates, consolidated their power. They didn't have to make so many concessions now. It looked like they could just settle for business as usual. They managed to get the lid back on that boiling political pot for now. And so Sertorius was left to make his own way. His mentor was out of the picture. His former patron, if that's what he was, Caipio, was permanently exiled, maybe dead by this point. And Sertorius must have been hugely disappointed in Marius and in the whole corrupt Roman system that Marius had been promising to somehow fix. But he realized there was no use in wallowing in resentment, waiting for some other big shot to notice him. He focused on what he could control, and that is honing his craft, the art of war, to wait till he got an opportunity to use it in the service of the Republic. Because he still believed in the ideals of the Republic, you know, that real virtue should be rewarded and promoted, that promises should be kept, and that the powerful should deal fairly with the weak. 
And after many years of soldiering in obscurity, far from the political limelight, toward the end of the 90s BC, at around age 30, Sertorius finally emerged in a big way into the public eye. It happened when he got his first major break as a leader. At last, he was sent on a mission to a place he would come to know very well, though he hardly could have guessed it then. He was sent to fight in Spain. Thanks for listening, and join us for the next episode of The Life of Sertorius, when things get even uglier, and people start to realize how good, and also how dangerous, Sertorius really is. But I want to point out right now at the end of this episode that we've already seen some of the qualities that make for a great leader in this man. Volunteering for extraordinary missions, a basic physical and mental toughness, enduring setbacks, determination to survive and thrive, and, despite the cards being stacked against him, a focus on what he could control. If you liked this and want to find out more or get involved, visit our website at ancientlifecoach.com. We have a weekly encouragement we send out via email based on the wisdom of ancient Greek and Roman culture and philosophy. You can sign up at the website. Also, don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platforms. And if you think the show merits it, leave a good review. Till next time, this is Alex Petkus.